going to begin our discussion of the um, digestive system. Um, we're just going to pick up on a lot of the information you've already talked about in general a and We're going to just take it to that next level. So recall from general a and you talked about how digestion begins in the mouth. You talked about the activity of saliva, which helps to moisten the food. It helps to begin starch digestion with the help of amylase and it helps to prevent infection by killing bacteria, some bacteria um, in the food that is taken into the mouth. So once it enters the esophagus, um, remember the esophagus lining is stratified squamous epithelium to prevent epithelium to prevent damage to the esophagus as we swallow food. And basically it is smooth muscle near the bottom of the esophagus and skeletal muscle near the top as it enters from the throat and as it works its way down there are waves of peristalsis that rhythmically contract and relax to move that food in one direction toward the stomach and at the bottom and at the top of the esophagus are sphincters which control the movement to prevent movement of food and liquid contents going from the stomach to the esophagus because when we have movement, when we have spasms or weakness of this lower esophageal sphincter, that's what leads to acid reflux. So as food enters into the stomach, the stomach walls are stretched and that's one of the stimulants uh, for digestions, digestive processes to begin. So we look at the stomach, it's uh, three muscular layers, three layers of smooth muscle, and the job of the stomach is to mix the food and turn it into a liquid called chyme. There's also different hormones that are secreted by the stomach, and we'll talk about each of those as we get into the individual cells that line the stomach mucosa. So when we look at the layers of the digestive tract, the mucosal layer is what is in contact with the food, so we find the mucosal layer is made up of simple squamous, I'm sorry, simple columnar epithelium, for digestive um, processes and absorption. And then we have the next layer, which is the submucosa, where we find the Peyer's patches. And then we have the muscular layer, which is three layers of smooth muscle in the case of the stomach, and two layers of smooth muscle in the other areas of the digestive tract, large and small intestine. And then the outer layer is the serosa, and the serosa is basically the visceral peritoneum, which would be what lines the outer uh, wall of these digestive organs. So that's the visceral peritoneum. So when you look at the stomach in terms of supply, blood supply and nerve supply, we have parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons that will either stimulate or inhibit digestion. We know that the parasympathetic neurons stimulate digestion and those neurons run through the vagus nerve. So if we stimulate the vagus nerve, we stimulate digestion, secretion, and um, smooth muscle contraction. The sympathetic neurons will inhibit digestion because remember the sympathetic is the fight or flight system and that's going to direct blood flow to skeletal muscle and heart muscle away from the digestive tract. So that's going to inhibit digestion. And we have um, the blood supply that we already talked about coming to and from uh, the stomach when you learned about blood vessels in general a &P. So looking at the stomach lining, remember we have these gastric glands that are lined with a variety of cells and these cells have different functions. So if we look at a major layer inside the mucosa, it's primarily mucus and looking at the cells that secrete that mucus, those are the surface cells. They secrete a thick alkaline mucus to help counteract that hydrochloric acid, very low pH contents that we see at the end of digestion. So these protect that stomach lining. So this is a, the, the surface cells secrete a thick alkaline mucus. When we get to the next cell, the dark pink cells, these are um, also mucus producing cells, but the mucus is thin and acidic, so the mucus differs a little bit from the surface cells. So this is a thin, acidic mucus. And then we see scattered among these are the variety of parietal cells. When we look at what parietal cells produce, they produce hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Hydrochloric acid helps to break down protein in the stomach. It, help active, it helps to activate um, an enzyme called pepsin, which helps with protein digestion as well. 
and it also helps kill bacteria. Many bacteria cannot survive in an acidic environment, so that HCL production in the stomach helps to kill bacteria in our non-sterile food. Intrinsic factor is a hormone that is produced that is required for the absorption of vitamin B12. So we need intrinsic factor to absorb vitamin B12 from our food and that helps us make red blood cells. So if you don't have intrinsic factor um, a production from parietal cells, then you don't have um, vitamin B12 and as a result of that uh, you will have something called pernicious anemia due to the, the inability to manufacture red blood cells. So what happens to those people is they need injections of vitamin B12 throughout their life. Chief cells secrete an enzyme um, called pepsinogen, and pepsinogen in the presence of HCL will be activated to become pepsin. And we said again, pepsin is needed for protein digestion in the stomach, and that is produced by chief cells. So if we go to our study guide, we can kind of review some of these topics we talked about, um, starting with the um, number 17 here, looking at the layers of the digestive tract, um, what types of tissues we find there, we talked about that, um, the functions of the sphincters, we said it's to prevent movement from the stomach back to the throat, peristalsis is what moves it there, um, factors that promote digestion and secretion, um, these are some things that we're going to talk about. But so far we've talked about um, the different functions of the secretory cells in the gastric glands of the stomach. We talked about the surface, the neck, the chief, the parietal cells. And then lastly we're going to talk about the different endocrine cells. And these are cells found at the bottom here in green at the bottom of the gastric gland. And their job is to secrete some chemicals either into the lumen here or to the blood. So the two paracrines, which are secreted locally, not to the blood, are histamine and serotonin. And the two hormones that are actually released to the blood are gastrin and, where did I put those on there? Oh, I didn't put it on, I have to add that. Um, gastrin and somatostatin. So those are two hormones that are secreted to the blood. Whoops, gas and I to help organize all these hormones and, and local factors that we're going to talk about um, I put them into a chart to help you kind of get to see the, the big picture for these different secretions so um, these endo enteroendocrine cells are um, some are secreted locally some are secreted to the blood so you can look at their function if we look at histamine and serotonin it stimulates HCL production stimulates smooth muscle contraction so that's always all going to promote um, digestion and motility in the stomach if we look at somatostatin and gastrin somatostatin is one that inhibits digestion and motility in the stomach so when the stomach is full, somatostatin will be released to inhibit further digestion, um, allow uh, the, the digestive tract to catch up and absorb nutrients, and then gastrin is going to promote smooth muscle contraction. So the only one of these three that really inhibits digestive activity in the stomach is somatostatin. So moving back then, um, we talked about chief cells, enteroendocrine cells. Again, these are paracrine secreted locally, not to the blood. It's secreted right into the stomach lumen, and these are secreted to the blood. Again, somatostatin is the one that inhibits digestive activity in the stomach. So looking at the mucosal barrier, we see um, a alkaline rich mucus to protect that stomach layer. Um, anytime we have inflammation or damage to the stomach wall, we have the risk of the our stomach contents leaking into the abdominal cavity, which could cause a serious infection. So we want to always make sure we're treating any, you know, inflammation or damage to the stomach lining. This is an example of a stomach ulcer caused by the bacteria Helicobacter pylori, which can be treated with antibiotics. So we talked about. Uh, physical digestion, just the moving of contents, peristaltic contractions, moving that food back and forth to form a liquid um, content, liquid substance called chyme, breaks down proteins with the help of pepsin and hydrochloric acid, 
um, secreting intrinsic factor and delivering that liquid contents to the small intestine. So factors that stimulate digestion are thinking, seeing, smelling food, um, having specific uh, hormones released to the blood. So if we look at vagus nerve stimulation, that's going to promote digestion. Um, hormone release, like gastrin, that's going to stimulate digestion. Those are all things that will stimulate digestion. So if we go back to our study guide, looking at factors that stimulate uh, the stomach motility and secretion, these are specifically um, factors that relate to that. So parasympathetic nerve stimulation via the vagus nerve, sight, smell, thought of food, and stretch of the stomach wall, and hormone release. So moving into uh, factors that can affect HCL secretion, these are all you know pretty detailed information. I'm not going to hold you accountable for that specifically, but just know that there are factors related to that that will either promote or inhibit HCL production. And sometimes we'll give people medicines to inhibit HCL production if they have trouble with acid reflux. So this just shows an example of these columnar cells. They have different names and they have different functions within them. So here, this is a parietal cell whose job is to make hydrochloric acid. So this is how that hydrochloric acid is actually produced. So looking at the interstitial fluid, it's taking hydrochloric acid, I'm sorry, it's taking um, chloride ion and carbon dioxide and in the presence of that, either producing bicarbonate to the blood or making HCL to the stomach lumen. So this is just the process by which that is made. Um, again, talking about peristalsis is what happens within the stomach to help uh, digest our food. I'm not going to look into more detail than that. And only in three milliliter spurts is chyme delivered to the small intestine. So only small little bits at a time enter the small intestine from the stomach. So as the pH changes in the stomach, that affects the movement of food from the stomach to the small intestine. And also the presence of high carbohydrate contents in the stomach will promote movement into the small intestine. So we know that sugary foods and starches are digested faster than fatty protein. Uh, laden foods. So if we want to slow digestion, keep our stomach full longer, fatty food tends to keep us full longer than carbohydrate food because it just takes longer to move through the digestive tract. You can see that fatty chyme will remain there six hours or more, where carbohydrate-rich uh, chyme moves much more quickly. So this just kind of talks about different things that will affect the movement of food through the digestive tract and promote uh, gastric secretion and emptying in the stomach. So there's different hormones that will affect that. We know that sympathetic versus parasympathetic activity, any dashed lines here are inhibitory effects on the stomach. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail other than what's on your study guide. So we know the small intestine is where we see majority of digestion and absorption. So you definitely want to highlight, underline this concept broken into three major areas. This is the most important area for digestion. A lot of the enzymes and accessory organs secrete their contents into the duodenum. So we talked about microvilli increasing surface area in the small intestine, very important, as well as the villi. Talk, this is just a lot of structural information. Remember the goblet cells found in those columnar cells help to secrete extra mucus talked about brush border enzymes at the microvilli level. Uh, we have different um, types of cells that line the small intestine with different functions. Um, we can see that some produce an intestinal juice, um, some release cytokines that help promote or prevent infection, some secrete hormones. Um, we have stem cells and we have other antimicrobial agents that are released. Uh, we have pyre patches in the pyre patches in the submucosa, um, and this intestinal juice is really important with helping enzymes work properly. It helps provide a, a solvent for the digestive products to be absorbed into the small intestine. 
And then we have the accessory organs. Remember, the liver's main digestive function is to produce bile, and some of that is stored in the gallbladder. About 30% of the bile produced by the liver is stored in the gallbladder, and when fatty contents enter into the duodenum, that stimulates contraction of the gallbladder to secrete bile into the duodenum. And the liver as well secretes its contents through the bile duct into the duodenum, all helping to break down fat. Talked a lot about um, function and structure of the liver cells in lab, so we're not going to revisit that again. Just, just a review here of the liver function. Again, primary function is to make bile. That's the digestive function. But it also stores some fat-soluble vitamins, um, helps process some of those nutrients, and detoxifies the blood. Talked about bile primarily um, for fat digestion. And when we look at where those bile salts go, they go to the duodenum. And then they are recycled, and they enter back into the blood and are resecreted into bile again. So we are constantly recycling those bile salts. Uh, the, ball, the gallbladder, again, is an accessory organ, and it uh, stores the bile for the liver. The pancreas, we know that um, it has an endocrine function, which is to secrete hormones to the blood, insulin to lower blood sugar, glucagon to raise blood sugar between meals. And then we have the exocrine function, which means it acts in the duodenum locally, and that is pancreatic juice and digestive enzymes. So the digestive function of the pancreas is to secrete a pancreatic juice and digestive enzymes. And that pancre pancreatic juice is, has a high pH to help digestive enzymes function. So we talked about that in class or, or in lab already. So we have lots and lots of enzymes produced by the pancreas. So people that have pancreatic cancer or have uh, pancreatic damage, um, pancreatitis, they can't eat anything. They have to receive enzymes um, through a pill form because they can't digest um, those products um, in their food, so they need all these enzymes in pill form. And if the pancreas is inflamed, we really put people um, um, off of food and don't allow them to eat until the pancreas settles down. So pancreatitis is a very difficult illness because patients can't eat and it's very painful as well. So we, again, we talked about the um, pancreatic juice is important to help enzymes do their job and they, all of this is occurring in the duodenum of the small intestine. So here's the pancreas secreting its job, um, secreting its juices, sorry, to do their job in the duodenum to promote digestion in the duodenum. I already talked about uh, bile secretion and some of the hormones that influence that. We're going to go to the table in your study guide that talks about cholecystokinin, which is CCK. Cholecystokinin, cola means colon, or sorry, cholesterol, sorry, which relates to bile secretion, and cysto refers to gallbladder. So when you think of the uh, hormone cholecystokinin, think of gallbladder and the liver are stimulated to secrete their contents to the duodenum when this hormone enters the bloodstream. And as well, we also see pancreatic enzymes also being stimulated by CCK. So we talked about um, you know that that chyme has partially digested carbohydrates, proteins, undigested fats, and that is all delivered to the small intestine for breakdown via enzymes and bile. So we have peristalsis promoting movement through the small intestine to the large intestine. We talked a lot about these structures in general a and so we're not going to revisit those, other than just paying attention that whenever we get to the end of the digestive tract, we can voluntarily allow a bowel movement to occur by relaxing the external anal sphincter. So any time we are actively controlling movement of substances out of a organ, that's via skeletal muscle under voluntary control. But the rest of the tract is smooth muscle. So the main function of the large intestine, when we think about um, large intestine, I want you to think of reabsorption of water and electrolytes. Very important that we pull back that water from digestion back to the blood and not let it leave the colon as diarrhea because that water is necessary for maintaining blood pressure and fluid status. 
A lot of this chemical the digestion um, is excess information, not something that you're going to be held accountable for. So you can skip these slides. And we talked a lot about metabolism already. So just know the major functions of the digestive tract as well as completing the study guide, of which I have posted a key with all the necessary information for the exam.